here to see the one, the only, Terro in all these moments that were you doing something on camera, there'd be a visual for you to bounce off of. 
So I don't necessarily go, oh, now I'm acting for a video game, so I'm going to approach this differently I'm in all those moments. But when you're doing an animated series, you get to work with the other actors, which is so much fun, and you get to play off each other. When you're doing a video game, you're by yourself. So it takes more, I think, effort to keep that energy up, to keep you in those moments. Um, and you have to stay really hydrated. I just did a video game this week that you guys are going to be totally stoked about that I'm not going to say anything about it. I know someone's filming and putting this on YouTube, and I don't want to get fired. But it was like a lot of death sounds and a lot of fighting sounds, and it's just you, so it's very yeah. tiring. But it's worth it to, to meet all you guys. Yeah. You know you're working with uh, someone who's just started in the MC when they ask you to do all the death sounds first, right? Yeah, you say no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right, let's move over to this line. What is your name? Julian. What was that? Julian. Everybody say hi. hi. <laughs> What's your question? This is the second time already. Um, so, what are your thoughts on the voice actors that are primarily known for doing the anime that brings from just to drop a few names? Johnny Young Bosch, Todd Habercorn, and the like, Robbie Damon to like, Jeremy Lee, Wendy Lee, and even uh, Cassandra Lee Morris. Well, you know, anime is a lot more work than doing um, original animation. You have to watch something that's already been animated in another language, match the lip flaps with your own acting beats and whatever words they want, and it's much more challenging from an acting standpoint. It takes a lot longer, like when we go first, we just get to be crazy and then they animate to our voice. But when you're doing an anime, you have to work really meticulously on time codes and, and making sure things match. So um, those guys are uh, amazing, and I've met several of them, because a lot of the anime people don't live in Los Angeles, so a lot of them are in really? Texas and different states, yeah. Um, but I, I love them so much, and the, one of the first times I met them was at an anime con years and years ago, and I hadn't, I hadn't known any of them, because like I said, they're not in L.A., and when they spoke about their characters, the audience went nuts, and I'm like, gosh, I've never even heard of these characters. So there's such a huge fandom for anime, and any anime that I've done, is really well received too. I, I love being in the Miyazaki films, and you know, Spirited Away is like such a beautiful, yeah, beautiful movie. So I, I give kudos to them for doing it all the time because it's tremendous work. Thank you very much. Hello there. Uh, it, is it Mr. Bank Bankman? I'm um, Eddie. <laughs> Um, first of all, I want to say uh, you are my favorite voice actors of all time. You actually even started getting me to do impersonations myself. Um, What's your best one? Um, huh? Oh, oh boy! Oh. <laughs> Kylie Griffin on the Extreme Ghostbusters, and uh, my question is, um, how do you feel that your character, Kylie, has been embraced by the Ghostbusters community as a fan favorite, and uh, would you like to see her in the live action? Yeah, that'd be fun. I'd like that series to come back, too. It was such a good series. And to have one of the Ghostbusters be a female, she was the first female, to have a Ghostbuster in a wheelchair, to have these amazing people coming together and be heroes that aren't necessarily on other shows doing this kind of <laughs> amazing superhero stuff was so cool and I love, there was a really great Kylie cosplay at a con I did, did recently um, and it, it was this gorgeous drag queen, I mean he was just beautiful and it was so meticulous like uh, kudos to all you guys that can make your own costumes. I mean, I can rock them, but I can't make them. And <laughs> these guys were just, <laughs> he was amazing. So I love that it's inspiring people, too. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, what's your name? My name is Amani. Hi, Hi. Amani. Hi. Um, my question was, who are your favorite and least favorite people to voice and why? My least favorite people to voice. Hmm. Well, that's not you did me, that would count. I hated doing you. That was terrible. Uh, my least favorite. I guess if it's like not a very memorable character, like if it's someone that has one or two lines, because the other thing for um, voice acting is they have one actor for up to three different characters, which is why most successful voice actors are very versatile. So they'll often say, oh, there needs to be a little boy in the scene, or a little girl, or maybe even a male person, or whatever it is. So I guess maybe some of the less memorable characters would be my least favorite. And my most favorite was Melody from The Mermaid 2, because I got to sing with Jodie Benson, and 
It was a dream come true, and I could have died the next day. <laughs> when you have those little roles, and they're small things, do you find yourself not wanting to use certain voices that you may want to hold back for something that's a little more meaty? Uh, how do you make them different from the other characters that you do, but not necessarily use up that intellectual property, that character, on something that may not come back? There is no using up in this frame. <laughs> you know, it's funny, I, I can't really explain it, but when I get a new character or a drawing of a new character, like, a new voice will just come to me, and I do all my first auditions in my home studio, so I get to make it perfect before it goes out. I like, I like to self-direct, not everybody does. Um, and the same goes for incidental characters. They'll just have a description of the character, and you read the script, you read the stage directions, so you know what's going on, so a new person comes down to play. Hi, what's your name? Hi, my name is Eric. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you so much. You've made my childhood wonderful, and I've enjoyed it as years to come. Um, my question for you is, you've done thousands, well, dozens of characters over the years, uh, some more bubbly than others, like bu uh, Bubbles and uh, Timmy Turner, and some more dark and demented, like Harley Quinn and Raven. Um, but has there ever been a time where you not done a character because it was the plot was either too confusing or you decided to hold back on it for a while and if so then why? I think in terms of saying no to parts, I mean maybe I've done it a couple times, but if it's a character I've already done, typically I'll say yes. Um, most voice actors do, don't tell the internet that, but most of us will come back for our characters over and over. Um, because once we create these characters, they they become part of us. So um, I, I do remember one role saying no to just because it was, um, let's say, making fun of an ethnic group of people that I didn't want to participate in because I didn't want to perpetuate any kind of fear against an entire group of people, so I said no. Thank you very much. We have a young man over here. Hi, what's your name, pal? Caleb. Huh? Hi, cute stuff. Can you come show the entire room how cute you are? Can you come here for a second? Let's get this job. Let's get this job. This, this is an insane amount of cuteness. Let's get this child. Are you the cutest child on the planet? I don't Can you tell me what you said to me when, when you brought the picture of you and your dad over and you wanted me to sign it? No. Can I, can I remind you? Because you and I are in the picture together, and I look particularly hot. And it's a picture of you and I together. And I said, do you want you and your dad on that when I sign it? And what did you say? No. <laughs> High five. What's your question? My very, very favorite, ooh, that's a tough one. Um, I really liked working with this guy named Mark Hamill. Have you heard of him? <laughs> and this guy named Kevin Conroy. Have you heard of him? <laughs> and I like all the cast of Teen Titans. I really like <laughs>
And do you want to take a picture with me and show him that you did? I'd love to. Come on. He would love that. <laughs> Oh, my childhood. 
You must have been very busy voicing all of these chocolates. I think there's a lot of people in here that owe me some babysitting money. That's it. Now, I question. Walk off with some awful Apple 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 Apple
when I go to voice another character, like I said before, like I imagine them in my head and they are like a being that exists, like basically I am a highly paid crazy person. <laughs> and um, uh, I, I always tell people if you want to get this business to take as many acting classes as you can, scene, study, improv, so that you can tap into different characters and sort of become these other beings. And singing lessons is important too, because like you said, a lot of it is control and this is a muscle, so you want to know how far you can go, what your range is, how to control um, volumes, and you know being at a microphone too, that your where you stand at the mic and what you're doing, it all comes with practice and putting in a lot of studio time. Um, and you sort of learn tricks, right? What to do at, at a microphone. Um, so when you do that, that, do that a lot, you don't really think about it. It just happens innately. And I couldn't really describe it to you because my process is different than everyone else's process. Like I was on a panel and they had asked an entire voiceover panel how you break down a character for an audition. And it was like me and Gray Delisle and John DiMaggio and Maurice Lamarche, you know, a bunch of hacks. And like, <laughs> everybody answered differently. Everybody. So it's really very personal personal and organic and it has to come from an active place. Thank you. Thank you. What about that? Thank you. <laughs> that picture you need? Okay. <laughs> Second City uh, in Canada, correct? In Toronto, which was their home. Yes. Yeah. And a lot of funny people came out of Second City, a Toronto. A lot of people. Well, a lot of the original Ghostbusters came out of Second City in Toronto as well. Um, Canada grows good peoples. They do. I've heard of I've heard this. Yeah, I like their coffee there better, too. Uh, a big Tim Hortons fan. Anyway. Um, the question about improv is, is not, it's not always just dialogue. You're building characters through the improvisation, the freedom to just go places, let the mind say yes, and take you into areas. How important has improvisation been, especially when you have to do voiceover work, where sometimes you don't get a chance to see the characters too much, you don't get to break it down. How important is your improvisational background and training in those situations? I think it's the most important, because you have to, in the studio, be ready if they say, we want to add a character here, and they might not have a line. That written out. So they're like, okay, they're at a concert, go. And you have to be fearless. So improv training helps you tap into that, not think about what you're going to say, and just sort of have things come to you organically being in those moments. And that, that kind of training is, I think, great for anything you're doing. Yeah. But particularly with voiceover, and also when you're, t when you're training improv, you create characters, so you have a bunch of other characters to sort of reach into your bag of tricks when it's your time. Like, they'll say, Often, we need a little girl here, we need a little boy here, we need that boy to now be a girl, <laughs> be a little older, a little younger, make her from England, like whatever it is, so that you're well versed in multiple characters, it's so helpful. Yeah, it isn't just the, the, the voice, a lot of people say I like to do a voice so I can do this, it, the acting, and it isn't in as much the acting, it's letting it flow, letting it be a part of it, you said you have so many voices that are in yeah. your head and you let them take control, right? Right, yes, they're the boss. <laughs> Oh. Sometimes it's problematic. <laughs> this is a lovely outfit. What's your name? My name is Maylon. Hi, Hi. cute stuff. Hi. <laughs> okay, so I love you so much. I love you too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I also have the ability to change my voice around, sound like different characters. And I was just wondering, like, do you have any advice for like people who want to go into the voice acting business? I'd say, um, you know, like I said before, take as many acting classes as you can. Then if you can get into a voiceover class with somebody really experienced or that casts jobs at Spark, and never, ever, ever pay to audition. This makes me really angry. There's nobody in my field that got there because they ever paid to audition. So that's a scam. So don't do that. Good luck. You. You're welcome. Thank you. Hi, Richard. Hi, Courtney. Um, I just want to 
just want to say once again thank you for being a part of our childhoods and you're such a sweet and caring person. Thank you. And my question is, I know there's children in the room. There's just one right behind you. Don't look now. <laughs> my question is, what is your favorite line on John Together? <laughs> Why did I know you were going to say that? You autographed my DVD earlier. And you already know what I said to you when I autographed such DVD. Didn't I? But my favorite stuff was with Cree and I, and um, Cree Summer and I did my very first cartoon together when I was 13. She was the bad cat and I was no kitty, she was cat in um, And the song where we make out in the hot tub <laughs> is pretty great. <gasps> you know, this black chick's tongue, it's such a new sensation. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hi, what's your name? Hi, my name is Anne. Hi, Anne. Um, have you ever wondered what would happen if some of your most iconic characters, who you've done Omi in there, uh, what would happen if they met? Yeah, people ask that all the time. Like they say, who would win in a fight? You know, Bubbles well, like, or Raven. But like, they don't necessarily have to get in a fight. They, they just meet. Like, like they're just hanging out. Right. Like Omi's hanging out with Raven. <laughs> like this is this is something you dream about a lot. Pretty cool, I guess. I mean, maybe some of them would annoy each other. Like Raven would probably be super annoyed by Bubbles. But maybe she wouldn't. Maybe they have a good time. Cause love, 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 We've got a young fellow over here. What is your name, sir? Hi, my name is Zachary. Hi, Zachary. I have a question. What is your favorite show of, In like, all time? Oh, <laughs> wow. That's a big question. What's your favorite show of all time? I'd say it's a toss-up between Teen Titans, Powerpuff Girls, Fairly Odd Parents, Batman. It's a Sophie's choice, isn't it? Yes, it is. I don't know. I've been so lucky. All my shows are so fun, and they're so great, and they're so fun to work on that I've had such a good time. So it'd be hard to choose just one. So it's a great question. If you could hang out with any one of her characters, who would you hang out with? I don't know. If I invited you for waffles, what would you say? Okay. Yeah! <laughs> I have so many dates in this audience. Thank you, Pat. Thanks, friends. Thank you. You have some friends here with you. Yeah, my question is kind of related to these two dragons. We saw a little bit last season with Smolder and Spike. How does Twilight feel now that Spike is getting some more dragon friends to help teach him how to be a dragon and stay a little more away from Twilight? Oh, people are so sad about that. Um, are, you, are you guys sad that, that Twilight and her friends are not coming back ever again? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they probably will. Yeah. Probably some question girl. How can we miss you if you don't go away? Yeah. Um, I'm sure Twilight is very happy for Spike. So maybe she gets more time to do some reading? Science stuff? Because science? He was running away halfway through that. You know? I know. He's like, I hate that. I want her to miss Spike. Hi, what's your name? Uh, hi. Hi. I'm, I'm Alex. Hi, Alex. Um, 
again, like everyone else has done, is to thank you for voicing my childhood just by like standing here. I learned that you voice more people than I thought. Like apparently you voiced the Hello old Hello Kitty cartoons. Hello Kitty's Fur Champion is proud to present I'm the Wizard of Paws. So my question doesn't specifically come from me, it comes from my sister, she from the all the way in Boston, who wanted me to ask her this, but how does it feel the fact that you've voiced all these characters and become so deeply ingrained in so many kids' childhoods? Like, how does that like I can't think of anything better to say than feel? How does that like resonate with you? How does that really how do you like think I think about when that? I when you when I really stop and think about all the amazing characters I've been gifted to play, not many people say I've played Raven, and Batgirl, and Harley, and Timmy, and Twilight, and all these really cool iconic characters, so I feel very, very lucky. And then when I meet people like you at fans, and they tell me how grateful they are, I can't tell you how many times I meet people and say, you know, Raven helped me through a depression, or watching Fairly Odd Parents got me through my parents' divorce, or um, having Twilight made me feel less alone because I had someone to relate to. So knowing that things that I've worked on have touched so many people is such a beautiful, rewarding thing. And unlike my predecessors like June or Mel, it was like before the internet, so they didn't really know how beloved they were. But it's why I'm here, because I want to give back to you guys to thank you for embracing me and loving what I do, and I'm grateful for all of you guys, too. We're grateful for everything you've done for us. Thank you. Thank you. Do you recognize this outfit over here? Yeah, I know that girl. What's that? Uh, not much, but, um, my name's Amber. Uh, everyone was like, that was pretty good. Thank you, thank you. I just have a question. Um, how long do you take to prepare for a new audition? You know, it depends. Um, often they'll give you the audition and it's due the next day or within two days. And like I said, I like to do it in my studio and there's a few reasons for that. One is I like the privacy because if you, the first audition is always at your agency and I don't like if people are listening or if I'm taking a long time and they're waiting and also I don't like someone else telling me how to do it. So I like to do it in my own studio and I'll edit it and like make it perfect to what I want. And if it's an easy script or if it just comes easily, sometimes it'll be quick, but sometimes I'll be in my studio for hours. So it really depends on uh, the job. And sometimes for auditions they have you learn a song to sing at the end of your audition. So that can take a while because you have to understand that you're competing with thousands of people. So if they say, we want you to learn this song, if you want to book that job, you better learn it, right? And you better sing it well, or sing it in character well. Because, you know, Timmy Turner doesn't sing so pretty. I wish every day it could be Christmas. It's not like a good singer, but you're singing in character, right? So I'm really conscientious about what I do before I send it off. And that's again where improv comes in, because sometimes it's okay to add little inflections or a little extra lines here and there, not too much or else you annoy the writer, so you don't want to do that. But um, it's, it's really, it, it could take five minutes or it could take a couple hours. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Hello there. Hi. What's um, your name? I'm Allie. Hi, Allie. Um, I was, I have like two questions. Is that all right? We'll see. questions, um, So I knew when I was three or four that I wanted to be an actress and a singer and a dancer, but I didn't know that I was going to primarily do voiceover. I certainly liked animation as a kid, but I didn't know that it was sort of a separate career, and in, in my mind it is, it is just another form of acting, so when some people say, oh, does everybody on camera do voice actor? It's like saying, does every tap dancer do, do ballet? It's a different form within acting. And, um, once I did Hello Kitty and then I did Beetlejuice, Care Bears, My Pet Monster, a whole bunch of amazing production that was in Toronto. I was so lucky to grow up with all those experiences. I'm so grateful because it really gave me a good resume before I moved to Los Angeles. Um, and the second question was, 
do I ever tap into other voices? Like when telemarketers call, I use other voices. <laughs>
coming up that you want people to see? Is there anything in particular that you'd like to let them know about? Well, I'm still doing Teen Titans. Have you guys seen Woo! the new DC Superhero Girls by Lauren Faust? Yeah! Great, great, great. great. Uh, the new Ben 10 we're still doing. I've been doing yeah. some secret Halloween stuff. Maybe, maybe I've been doing some secret stuff. Uh, I work every single day. There's a, an on-camera movie that I do that there's a Kickstarter for called Witness Infection. I play um, uh, like zombie mafia chick. So I'm gonna track that down. That sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> After the makeup, now I know I should have turned that down. But um, if you follow me on my social, it's just at Tara Strong, and you can keep up with everything I'm doing. All right, and you'll be back down in your booth. I'm going right back down to my booth. So if you want to go down and ask a question of Tara, head down to her booth. And thank you all for coming here today. Thank you.